first, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And I know that you are all looking forward to Saturn. And here we are. And of course, we're joined by none other than the great Carl Sagan. Freshly pulled out of the dryer. And he's going to tell us and guide us and be with us in spirit. And acknowledge uh, the amazing nature, the truly wonderful perception of nature. The fact that star of the show tonight, Saturn. I always like looking at this, this fantastic, um, depiction. I like the, I'm a fan of the lettering. Saturn really, uh, although it's second to Jupiter in size, it really, really is the most beautiful thing observable from Earth on a minor telescope, I think, personally. Before we dive in to the gravitational well of Saturn, I just wanted to shout out uh, a few people who requested it. I believe it was. Well, Houston, I believe you requested it a 
Sparkus. And finally, Dr. Betus. <laughs> Dr. Betus. <laughs> so, hope you guys enjoy this. A crescent Saturn here in the picture. Looms large over the desolate. I see low hills of Rhea, one of the planets, 17 or more moons, and I think it does have more than 17 nowadays. Always have to remember when this book was written, because we are going to be reading, yeah, 19, 1980, so this National Geographic book. So you must remember there is nearly, wow, 40 years of science and observation since. So Maria, about half the size of our moon and more than half a million kilometers from Saturn, gleams bluish in the cold light of the distant sun. Saturn's magnificent ring system appears as only a thin line from Rhea because Rhea orbits Saturn at about the same plane as the orbits rings. Looking at them edge on, if you will, but the sunlight casts a wide ring shadow on Saturn. We can see here. The dark patch that links the Terminator and the limb just above the thin ring line. When Galileo studied Saturn with his telescope in 1610, he saw the rings faintly as two knob-like shapes, and it really does look like that. and he called them ears. Saturn's moon, Tethys, about two-thirds the size of Rhea, is seen in the crescent phase left of the Terminator. The moon, Dion. planet in our solar system, Saturn is a gas giant, and like its neighbor, larger, Jupiter. But because Saturn's clouds of ammonia snow are not so stormy, it's sometimes called the quiet Jupiter. The quiet Jupiter. The quiet Jupiter. symbol of Saturn. It looks kind of like a 
with a Christian cross with a question mark, the tip of a question mark, or perhaps a scythe. And in the time of Italy, harvest time belonged to the god of reaping. Okay, so that's probably a scythe. Whom the Romans called Saturn. A symbol curved like this sickle, or sickle apparently, <laughs> represents the planet. Now on Saturn it rotates at an axis tilt. I suppose ours is... 23 degrees, so 26.7 here is actually not that different than Earth. But the length of the day certainly is. It appears to be rotating quite fast at about 10 hours and 40 minutes. The length of its year is 30 Earth years. So its day is halved. And its year is 30 times. It's going almost 10 kilometers per second in its orbit around the sun. Its average distance, about 1.429, or uh, guys, our first billion we ran into kilometers from the sun. God, that seems so ridiculously far. What do you think, Carl? That's pretty far, right? Yes, I would agree. So imagine going all the way from Mercury to Mars through the asteroid belt and on to Jupiter. You would have to travel almost as far again to reach Saturn. Here you see the sixth planet from high over its north pole, a view impossible from Earth, since we are indeed pretty much in its plane. Scientists know that at least 17 moons orbit Saturn. Titan, the biggest, holds a thick atmosphere. A thick atmosphere. Phoebe, the most distant, seems here to be partway around the sun. Wow, is that, is that supposed to be Phoebe? Jesus. But only because the sun shown closer and larger than it really is. Okay, so I suppose these objects here are proportional in size and distance, whereas the sun, of course, is. If it were this distance away, it would probably be, um, well, probably too small to uh, even indicate with a single So I see particles moving to this page form the wide thin rings that wheel above Saturn's clouds. Frigid at the top, the atmosphere grows thicker and hotter without ever reaching solid ground. Saturn radiates excessive energy, maybe because heavier helium separates from hydrogen in the interior. Turns to drops and sinks. The friction releases heat. Saturn's mass is equal to about 95 Earths, but it takes about 760 
that makes it at least <laughs> the least dense gas giant. 70% as dense as water because of Saturn's fast spin and flat shape. Gravity varies from the poles to the equator. So we see, of course, because Saturn does take 30 years to orbit the sun. As we go once a year, Saturn's just making a slow progression. So for every one of our spins, it completes one thirtieth of a circle. Here we can see the relative perspectives from Earth. From 1971 to, uh, I suppose, the predicted 1995 at the time of this book. Here we have the layers, the cloud tops, ammonia, ice, clear atmosphere, ammonia hydrosulfide icy clouds, and water ice clouds, and water ammonia clouds, and the more clear atmosphere. And then they think that's just a, just the surface and they think that liquid hydrogen is the red you see here. Then the orange is liquid metallic hydrogen, so more densely compressed. And then the blue represents water and ammonia. And then perhaps the very center is not solid, but molten, hot, extremely pressurized rock and the ring thickness for all these measurements of uh, these numbers of billions of kilometers this one is less than one tenth of a kilometer and that would be the rings thickness although they reach out to about 73,000 kilometers on each side from Saturn, whose diameter alone is 120,000 kilometers. Here we have a beautiful artist's depiction of the chaotic yet uniform debris field. So, Saturn's parallel jet streams and brilliant halo of rings shimmer against the black sky. In this enhanced Voyager portrait, Saturn's rings are gigantic. If you could take a spacecraft, a spacewalk around the outer edge, going 25 kilometers a day, it would take you 95 years to get back. 95 years. Quite the Sunday stroll. So, a uh, over here, a broken moon. Or a moon that never was. Astronomers do not yet know how Saturn's rings actually came to be. We do know that they're full of icy particles. But it seems to blur into a band of unearthly hail around the planet. One ring is so thick with rubble Almost no light can pass through it. So 
So our journey across space from Jupiter to Saturn has taken a year and a half of traveling at an average of 50,000 kilometers an hour. 50,000 kilometers an hour. And the space station is uh, orbiting at 17,000 miles per hour. Saturn now looms ahead, a huge misty yellow globe. Just imagine the, uh, I think Arthur C. Clarke did a brilliant job of uh, portraying the, just the, the magnitude and the awe and the lumen, just the sheer size, the size of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, of course, but uh, Saturn just looks like just looks like a uh, something meant for us to explore. We've been obsessed with shapes, all geometrical shapes, rings, spheres, cubes and triangles and pyramids, and more multi-sided shapes as well. But no doubt Saturn, with its seemingly symmetric configuration in its stark contrast with the velvet black night sky behind it as we approach it looms large and it just must seem so so magical to approach you can only imagine the first astronauts Explore Saturn. They must. It must be a, a near religious experience. And it's so beautiful to think about. And Arthur C. Clarke in 2001 and the sequels to that did such a brilliant job of uh, explaining. spacecraft and a small away team. Yet this team gets it gets trapped and they get whisked away into another unknown part of the galaxy. And before we know it, what had happened was this vehicle acted as a specimen collector that simply listened to this audiobook and in fact all four books in 2001 I, I went on a binge a few years ago 
science fiction binge, and I had Apex playing in the background the whole time, and it was so beautiful, it just added so much depth to the experience, and, you know, I think that when objects coalesce, these random atoms of our universe coalesce into intrinsically beautiful objects and majestic and grand and magnificently large objects such as planets and especially our Earth. Again, when you view it from that perspective, our Earth is such a, an oasis in the desert of the cosmos. I think Carl Sagan all to say that I think there is a connection intrinsic to our nature and our minds that we love and find meaning in looking out and projecting and speculating on what might be out there what positive and perhaps very um Courageous, very dangerous phenomena might be out there that would take courage and intrepid explorers, but nonetheless would make us better for it. And I think Saturn is in our backyard and is certainly one of those. So Sorry to digress on an art artistic perspective for a minute, but um, I just find so much meaning in it, and I appreciate that you guys do too. So thank you for watching this. You guys are all so supportive, and it's awesome. But of the planets, Saturn is, of course, second only to Jupiter. The giant has about 95 times more mass than Earth. We already said that, though. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why the book is repeating itself. Um, okay. Let's finally move on to the next page. That's cool. Saturn only gets one hundredth of the heat and light that we do on Earth. At about a million kilometers from Saturn, we, we meet the planet's powerful magnetic field. Much, much, much stronger than Earth's. This magnetic bubble, this bubble pulses in and out with the changing force of the incoming Solar winds, solar winds, solar winds. But as with Earth and Jupiter and Saturn, has a radiation belt charged with solar particles trapped by the planet's magnetic field. If we entered these belts unprotected, the radiation would sizzle us. And these uh, appear to be a picture of its rings. Let's see if there's a picture of its radiation belt. It's uh, magnetic fields. No, it doesn't. So if, so if I did this right, I would. 
external solar winds applied to it. And what's interesting is that our Earth, too, is protected from most of the time from the mild, the more milder bursts of solar winds. circle Saturn, get up close to it, streaks of lightning tear through this yellowish, yellowish white cloud deck near the equator, where winds whoosh. Crystals of ammonia ice give the upper clouds a yellowish color, but most of the atmosphere is hydrogen and helium, with some methane and other gases. And the top of Saturn's atmosphere is much colder than the top of Jupiter's. We expected this considering Saturn's much greater distance from the Sun, but farther down the temperatures rise more than we would expect from solar heating. as much heat as it receives from the sun. And a little history lesson is that Galileo was probably the first to see Saturn through a telescope. And he acknowledged that uh, he reported some odd bulges. He, uh, you know, of course, anthropologically or anthropomorphically centered them as um, Centered. I don't know why I said that. Anthropocentric. It was in my mind. <laughs> yeah, identified them as ears. But then, 46 years later, only 46 years later, the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens identified the ears, the ears, as the big ring. And then in 1675, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini spotted a gap in the ring, now called the Cassini Division. The Cassini Division. The outer half is called the A ring, and the inner, brighter half, called the B ring. The B ring. The B ring. Yeah, no, I'm not going to make any jokes about the A-ring. That's for when we get to Uranus. <laughs> In 1850, other astronomers discovered the faint C-ring. 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 But Saturn's ring's story seems endless, really. In 1966 and 69, observatory photographs showed an E-ring and a close-in D-ring. The 
September 1979, Pioneer 11 spotted an F and G rings, and the rings were named in order of discovery, not distance, from the planet. So they started about 3,000 kilometers above the atmosphere. And some 420,000 kilometers wide. For those of you imbibing your herbal medications and teas, we prepare to explore the sprawling system that makes the planet one of the mo most splendid sites in our solar system. We start at the D-ring, the innermost, and find it wispy belt, a wispy belt of thin ringlets. Saturn's rings are made up of thousands of such ringlets. And uh, kind of like the grooves of a phonograph. The ringlets are composed mostly of water and ice but perhaps some of rock, probably ranging in size from dust specks to houses, to entire houses. So we have rings with moonlets, the Cassini division between the A, then we can see a better idea of the black Cassini division. Was once, it was once thought to be empty, but in fact, it's kind of like how a, uh, a gravitational body you would expect to act as it. Oh, by the way, you guys should, uh, I'm curious, I mean, he doesn't need the support, he has half a million subscribers, but this guy. But yes, if we took a and that's perhaps Jupiter right there. This would be uh, some rings here, some rings here. kind of what you would expect. It cleans up all the things in its path. So, the uh, moons act as attractors and anything in its relative orbital radius gets pulled in, you know. But yeah, a lot of the um, gaps in the rings apparently form from a gravitational type of uh, tug. strange orbital dance 
unique in the solar system. Oh, I've seen that before. It looks very cool. It's like it's like they uh, form a helical structure. Gravitationally attract to one another. Gravitationally attract. And now they're bound together in the same orbit, orbital dance. The same dance at the same distance from the, uh, from the surface of Saturn. seen some depictions, some little depictions of it, and it's quite amazing to look at. And then Enceladus, one of the strangest little moons in our solar system. Its surface has many kinds of terrain, old craters around it. Over time, newer ones with the sharp contours, broad plains, possibly even volcanoes, because of course Saturn is so large and there's so many more bodies interacting around it that there's a lot of tidal forces, which tidal forces are just really um, the gravity. So powerful that it pulls on the body, stretching it, and as you know, rock tends to fracture and crack, 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 crack. when you uh, exert too much tension. Why doesn't the big moon's gravity throw off the small moon? In the late 1700s, French mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange, Lagrange determined that a large moon's orbit could also hold one or more small moons, but only if they were about 60% ahead or behind the large moon. And of course, that's a weird effect. i 
imaginary and pulling it towards one another because then they would just simply fall in to each other. They're actually moving around it. And in some weird way, at 60 degree interval, there are weird Lagrange points ahead of it and behind it that act as gravity wells. Two others were later found sharing the orbit of Tethys. The Lagrangian moons, each 60 degrees from the big moon. And then Rhea is the second largest moon of Saturn, four times the size of Mima. Titans, king of Saturn's moons. Titan is a special moon. It's larger than Mercury. It has an atmosphere denser than any other moon in the solar system. Base ground photos show Titan glowing reddish orange, which suggests an atmosphere of mostly hydrocarbons. But Voyager surprised everyone by finding that Titan's air is almost all nitrogen, like Earth's. Yeah, but I doubt not. Because I had forgotten this one. Some 200 kilometers deep, Titan's air includes argon, methane, and other gases present on Earth's Earth atmosphere. Early atmosphere, sorry. And some scientists think that Titan's atmosphere is evolving much as Earth's primitive air did four billion years ago. On Titan, we may have a snapshot of the atmospheric evolution that took place on Earth aeons ago. Yes. Okay. Visitors to Titan will find cold weather, perhaps negative 180 Celsius. God, that's so beautiful. of foggy methane, casting dim, reddened lights on a land made mostly of ice. Our journey continues past the minor moon Hyperion, a pear-shaped chunk apparently covered with dusty ice. We reach Iapetus, another mystery object of almost pure water ice on the side of the 
one side of this moon is white as snow and shines ten times brighter than the other side. The dark side may be covered with dust that falls on the moon from space, or perhaps with a thick, dark, inky substance that oozes from the interior of my impetus. Farthest of all moons is lonely Phoebe, lonely Phoebe, 13 million kilometers away from Saturn. Phoebe may simply be a captured asteroid, for it alone revolves backwards around the planet. As our spacecraft hurls past, we recall one astronomer's ball. Phoebe, Phoebe, whirling high in our neatly plotted sky. Phoebe, listen to my light. Won't you whirl? exploring space, but he was also an advocate of using that broad perspective that it gives you about our place in the universe, and turning it back on it, on ourselves, and recognizing that we are alone and adrift as far as we know in this vast cosmos, billions and billions and billions of light years across, and it's in our best interest, and it's in the most meaningful way we can perceive life, to try our best to be our best, build our skills, become experts in our domain so that we can help understand each other and we can help project ourselves into a brighter, more optimistic, more fruitful, more meaningful nature.